Everybody, good to have you here this evening. Hope you've had a great, great day or a restful day or a restful week or hopefully not too busy anyway. And uh, all right, take your song books. Go number 327, 327. We'll sing the first and the last verse of number 327, Springs of Living Water. All right, let's stand together as we sing number 327. Information kind of messed up first little bit. Uh, he is still in the hospital though. He's been kind of uh, supposed to come home every day, and uh, but he does not have a, a, a lacerated liver. And uh, but I think he is a heart patient. I'm beginning to gather, and so they were just double checking him for his oxygen and stuff. And uh, they've had to go in today and take some fluid off his lungs. But I, I don't think that's the result of the accident. I think that's something that's kind of been happening off and on for a little bit. So, uh, But hopefully within a couple of days he'll be home, and, uh, but he is doing okay. And then for those of you who have been here a long time, I uh, got word last night that uh, Mr. James Lett passed away. And uh, he will have his funeral on Saturday up in Sherall. And so uh, pray for the Lett family and uh, pray that the uh, Lord... Uh, Use us to help the family, okay? All right. Anybody else? Any additions or uh, updates on anybody? 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 Any additions or updates? Okay, Brother Bob. I saw that, but how many? 37? 27? 27. So this will be Dr. Coward's son, grandson. Okay. So pray for the Coward family. And that was unexpected, wasn't it? Okay. All right. So pray for the Coward family. And Trey. Okay. So pray for the pray for the Coward family. That, that's, that's tough. All right. Yep. All righty. Miriam Jones, knee surgery, 13th. Okay. All right. Pray that everything goes well. You, you're just going to do one at a time, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Kevin? Okay. All right. Well, I don't know about that, but let's let's pray for that. That that's a tough that's a tough situation out there. All right. Yeah, Mr. Tom. All right. He's having a, some AFib problems. All right. June twenty seventh. else? Anybody? All righty. Well, 
let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, do bow before you today and thank you, Lord, that you do love us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be together. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to study your book. Uh, pray, that, Lord, you'd help us, give us understanding of it. Uh, pray, Lord, for these that, Lord, we've mentioned tonight. I pray that you would, uh, Lord, intervene for them. I pray, Lord, again, for Miss Mason, that you'd help her, give her strength, and, Lord, physically just help her. And I pray for the Coward family. I, I think of Miss Coward, Lord, I just pray that you'd help her and give her uh, Lord, special, uh, uh, Lord, just, just some special grace for this time. I pray that she touch there and help. And Lord, then Ms. Jones, she's going to have knee surgery. May, Lord, everything just go perfectly good with that. We go to Tommy. Lord, you'll touch him. Give the doctors wisdom. May, Lord, they, they find out something that can help him. And we we'll just trust you, Lord, just to take care of him. And I pray that, Lord, you will Lord, be with the Lett family. I pray that you'll bless the funeral on Sunday. I pray that, Lord, they'll understand the gospel. And, Lord, I pray that you'll just do a work, yeah, Lord, there in that. Lord, bless us tonight. Give us, Lord, your power and liberty. And I pray that, Lord, you give us understanding of your book. Give us a desire to obey it and live it. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. A uh, couple of announcements while I'm here. Um, I do remind you that not this Saturday, but next Saturday is our soul winning day. And uh, we are... Uh, that's the day of the car show, so I'm not sure how to what degree we're going to be able to help in that, but if, it, if, not, if nothing else, we're going to be there passing out tracks, all right? And so, and knocking on doors, whatever. So uh, we try to get all that worked out and having a hard time finding information. And uh, so, all right, and then tomorrow, uh, the ladies who can are going to help Miss Pam. Uh, they're going to cook some more meals tomorrow, get ready for the men's, uh, uh, the men's home, and we'll get it down there just as soon as we can. And uh, so they'll work tomorrow about 10 until 12 or so. And so if you can come be a part of that, that would be great. And then on next Tuesday, we got Men's Fellowship. It seemed like it's been forever since we had our meeting. We we're going to skip one, had revival that week. And it seemed like it's been a long time. And we are about one month away from vacation Bible school. And uh, we're trying to get it all together and just pray the Lord to, to help us. And we are trying to reach a, a bigger crowd. We're going to have billboards up and try to just get the crowd to come. And uh, so pray everything works well. We have folks saved during the week, and uh, that's really what it's all about. And uh, speaking of that, um, we hope we've been having contests the uh, last several years with our, with our vacation Bible school. And, and so this, this time, we're going to combine them all together. All right, you can compete however if you want to, and uh, you can do any kind of art, uh, drawings, or paintings, watercolor. Uh, you can do any kind of craft, uh, let's do a paper or thread, uh, any kind of wood, metal, fabric, and needlework, basket weaving, whatever you want to do. All right, and then uh, we're gonna have a, a writing department. You can you can write a story, make a poem, a patriotic, and uh, or even write a song, and. Uh, have we done cooking before? I don't remember cooking. This is new. Okay. I don't know who's going to judge this. I might be scared to do that. And uh, all right. But if you want to, uh, you know, like a dessert, uh, arrange it, you know, red, white, blue, or whatever, and our cakes, cupcakes. And uh, anyway, so uh, we'll get more information to you, and we'll have it out so you can look at the, the form. And uh, all right. Looking forward to it. We'll have a big time. And uh, all right. Let's take our song books again. Uh, what, what, which one was that one? What number was when you was playing? Learning to lean? I oh, didn't turn the page. All right. All right, 341. 341. All righty. Victory in Jesus. Let's stand straight to my
tithes will come and take up the seed and its offering. And I appreciate your faithfulness to give and meet the needs of other people. And uh, all right. Well, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that the Lord you will help us tonight. Again, I pray that you will bless our time together, bless this offering. I pray that Lord you will help us to meet the needs of others with it. And I pray that Lord they'll come to understand who you are and what their need is. And bless each one that gives now. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and uh, believe it or not, I think we might finish the chapter tonight, uh, unless I go back and hit it again, I don't know, we'll see, there's a bunch in here, and so tonight I am just going to kind of skim over and get you the whole, the whole uh, uh, gist of it, and uh, I think you'll uh, understand that in a minute, <clears throat> all right, Romans chapter 5, we're going to begin with verse number 12, and um, All right, I'm going to explain something to you. We're going to read it a little different, all right? So uh, uh, if you look at your Bible, Romans chapter number 12, and I'm uh, sorry, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Um, if you look at verse 13, the first sign you see, the first uh, figure you see in verse 13 is a parenthesis, okay? Y'all see that? Okay, and so uh, if you have one parenthesis, you have to have an ending parenthesis, Okay. Well, the ending parentheses is at the end of verse 17. All right, so what we call that in English is from verse 13 to verse 17 is a parenthetical uh, paragraph in English, all right? And so if you look back at verse 12, if you look at the end of verse number 12, it does not end in a period, okay? The end of verse number 12 ends in a colon. And uh, so that means the sentence continues. So the sentence that makes up verse 12 is verse 12 and then verse 18, okay? Uh, verses 13 through 17 is a paragraph that gives added information about the topic that we're talking about. So here's what I want to do. I want to read verse 12 and then go down to verse number 18 and then go back and read verses 13 to 17, all right? So we can have the sentence. The sentence is 12 and 18 is the sentence, all right? And uh, so... Uh, that has to do with English, has nothing to do with Hebrew or Greek or whatever, all right? That's just English. All right, here we go. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And so that is the sentence, all right? It was talking about one man uh, sin entered into the world. That man was Adam. And I uh, go down to verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came. Uh, so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came, all right? And so now we're going to go look at verses 13 through 17, all right? And see what information is there. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not, or that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also as the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And uh, verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now that's a lot. All right, there's a lot of stuff there, and uh, so we're going to try to unpack it. All right? Heavenly Father, I pray that you help me as I try to teach your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give us understanding of it. I pray that you give my mind clarity of thought. May I teach it like you would want it taught, and may we live it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're slowly making our way through. We're going to finish chapter 5 tonight, and uh, remind you the first two and a half chapters gets the whole world lost and guilty. The next chapter and a half begins to show us God's redemptive plan. Uh, that it is God. God wants, to, God wants to fellowship with a very ungodly world. And God has to maintain His holiness. So God devised a plan that included justification, redemption, propitiation, and imputation. And so those are just some of the, we've already looked at it, I'm not going to go back and deal with those again. Uh, but but those, are, those are the components that make up God's plan whereby He can redeem the ungodly and the guilty and still maintain His holiness. Again, uh, God, God is going to maintain justice and holiness. Now, I, nothing amazes me more than the love of God. It is absolutely phenomenal what God did because He loves us. This is quite an elaborate plan that God put together so He could redeem us because He loved us and still maintain His deity and His godliness and His holiness. And so that's, that's the plan. We've dealt with that many, many times. And so uh, then we dealt with the idea that there are benefits, and we're starting to see the benefits of being justified. And we've looked at them. We have peace with God. We're no longer at war with God. We have peace with God. Next, we have access to God. We have the ability to come into His presence, uh, which is a phenomenal thing. That we were one time ungodly, we were guilty, we were separated from God, and now because of God's plan, I have access to the throne room of grace. I can go there, you can go there. We don't have to have our own priest. You don't have to go kiss some St. Peter's toe somewhere. Uh, you don't have to count a bunch of beads. You can go to the throne room of grace yourself because you've been justified and now you have access. Then uh, we looked at the, 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 the here in chapter 5 where uh, we can rejo rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That because of what God has done in our lives, we now have the potential of bringing glory to God. Where in the first two and a half chapters we were ungodly, guilty, nothing. But now that same group of people now have the potential to bring honor and glory to God. And let me just say, every person who's been justified, Every person who has been redeemed, if you understand what has happened, you ought to want to try to bring honor and glory to God. Amen. You ought to want to try to do that. There's something wrong. It reminds me of the ten lepers. You know, nine of them got what they wanted and left. The only one returned and gave, and gave God thanks. And we look at that, but I promise you, that is the right percentage. That is the right percentage. I promise you, uh, there's a tithe of the people who, who, are, uh, who, who, who get a hold or get the idea of salvation by grace that really ever try to give honor and glory to God. And, uh, and then uh, the, the, the next one was the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. There's something changes in here uh, that makes you a totally different person. I said it, it, is, it is the catalyst that produces the change in your life that brings honor and glory to God. That we were one time selfish, we were self-centered, we were ungodly. And now because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, now we have a desire to please somebody other than ourselves. And that is, that is the catalyst for change. And um, then uh, verse number 6 through 8, we looked at that, that. That's the difference between the love of God and the love of man. The love of man can die for his friends. The love of man can die for those that are in his group. The love of man can die for those that are like him. But the love of God dies for those that are ungodly. And uh, there's a vast difference there. 
And then verses 9 through 11 we dealt with last we started in on this uh, is the theme of really the rest of the chapter is the idea of much more. Um, there's so much more that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ than you had before Him. To the point that coming to know the Lord as your Savior is there's so much in this package. There's so much in this gift that I, I think some people, uh, we, we, we get so enamored, I guess, with the bow that we play with the bow and don't actually enjoy all the things that's in the gift. And there are so many things in this gift, and it's so much more. And, and honest to goodness, I don't know why we don't have a desire to know what this stuff is and apply it to our lives. And, and I, I think it's because we got to go back to the love of God hadn't done something here yet. That we just, we, we, we're just satisfied just to stay like we are, you know, get my name written down in the last book of life, let me miss out on hell, and I'll just coast the rest of the way. But the truth of the matter is it doesn't work that way. You're going to find out that that's not how it is. And so, um, so verses 9 through 11, we were reconciled. And uh, we did, uh, we'll just, if you look at it just real quick, um, verse number 10, it says, uh, for, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Now, we were enemies to God, and because of everything God has done, and we're now reconciled, God and I are now friends. But it doesn't stop there. The, let, the rest of that verse says, uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, of, let's see. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see here. We have become, uh, let's much more than, verse 9, much more than being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The word atonement, if you look at it, it says at one. And so God and I are, are together as one. But not only have we been reconciled, but God has now given us the ministry of reconciliation. We talked about that last week. God has given that to us. So we have the privilege of being reconciled. But it doesn't stop there. God wants you and me to be the peacemakers. See, the whole world is an enmity with God. God says, now I want you to go and, and, and reconcile somebody to me. We, we call that soul winning in the Baptist church. We call that trying to get the gospel to somebody. We understand that they're ungodly before God and they're, they're destined to a devil's hell, but God loves them, and we're trying to get them back in harmony and back in fellowship with God. It's called reconciliation. So there is much more to being reconciled. There is the, there is the work of reconciliation that you can be a part of. Now, uh, go to verse 12. It says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This is one of the key words, kind of the key verses we use in the Romans Road. Um, uh, and I, I use the Romans Road when I, it's sort of the plan that I follow when I'm dealing with somebody about heaven. Uh, but it says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world? Now, uh, we, we know that that one man is Adam. And I, I started I start just to spend a, the, whole, the whole night on Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but we know that story. All right? I'm not going to go back there. But we know that Adam, when Adam sinned, that he plunged the whole world into sin. And that's what the Bible says. It says, by one man, sin entered into the world. And so, uh, uh, because of him, we have now have sin and death. We now have cemeteries. We now have relationships that are, that are totally over with because of death. Now, notice James 1.14. It says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, because of the sin of one man, sin entered into the bloodstream of every man. I, 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 how to explain this? Because we have a hard time saying that because of Adam, I, 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 I'm a sinner. Uh, I, I read this. A man says, um, uh, my, my grandfather uh, immigrated to America. I was never thought of. But because I was in my grandfather, I immigrated to America when he did. All right? You, you get that. 
I, I would not be in America today if my grandfather had not immigrated over here. I wasn't here, but I was in my grandfather. And so it's kind of the same idea that we are in Adam. And because Adam sinned, we have all, by, by nature, have sinned against God. It is in our bloodstream. All right? it, has, it has been passed to us. It's kind of like uh, if, if, you, if you have blonde hair, you're liable to have kids that have blonde hair. All right, if, you, if you're tall, you're liable to have kids that are tall. Vice versa, you pass down your, your characteristics. Well, what we got from Adam was the poison of sin in our veins. Now, uh, we, don't, we don't like that. Uh, I like the verse that says the life of the flesh is in the blood. But did you know death is also in the blood? Everybody's going to die. The soul that sinneth it shall die. All right? And so it, it's, it's in the bloodstream too. You and I are not going to, we're not going to escape here alive. Now, go down to verse 18. We're going to look at verse 18. We're probably going to look at the rest of them and then go back to verse 13. It says, verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Now, the word con condemnation means that you have been found guilty, you've been sentenced and you're just waiting on execution, all right? You, you are a condemned person. It says, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, um, so if, if one man can plunge the entire human race into hell, then doesn't it make sense that one man, by his own righteousness, can save the race from hell? All right, so... That is, that is the mindset, that's the economy of God. Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by grace of God should taste death for every man. That's what Jesus did. All right, He did it for every man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, and that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, go down to verse number 20. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. There's that word again, much more. It's five times in this past scripture, much more, much more, much more. And so the law came that sin might be made known. Now, uh, Romans 7, 12, we'll get to it when, one day. Uh, it says, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So God, God sent the law. And God sent the law. The law was never designed to save anybody. The law was always designed to show us how far short we are of the glory of God. God said, this is the standard, this is the law, and this is where you mess up. And the law was always designed to show us our need of a Savior, not provide us a Savior. And so uh, Galatians uses the term schoolmaster. It says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the, 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 the word schoolmaster is they're using, it's a type, but it, it's simple of the law. All right, so let's read that again. It says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. The law brought us unto Christ, that we might be justified by, justified by faith. The law convinced me of my sin. The law convinced me of my need of a Savior. The law then brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the verse, the verse check, Galatians 3.25 says, But after that faith has come, I put my faith in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. That means we're no longer under the law. Now, that's a powerful statement. By the way, that is the only way God cannot impute iniquity to us. We've already looked at that in, in, in imputation. That when Abraham went by faith and he was imputed righteousness and God did not impute his iniquity to him. The only way that can happen is something's got to happen to the law. All right? Now, go back to verse 13. Go back to verse 13. <clears throat> now, this is the parentheses. This is uh, this ad getting us, giving us added information to the sentence. Verse 13, for until the law, 
sin was in the world. Now, <clears throat> the law came to Moses on Mount Sinai. Okay? I know sometimes it things that kind of all run together, uh, but Adam was made, and uh, Eve, and, and uh, they're in the Garden of Eden. The law shows up with Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a distance or time there of about 2,500 years. You've got to go around at 1,800, 2,000 years to the flood. Then you've got to live through the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. You've got to go through 400 years of, of bondage in Egypt, and then Moses shows up and get them out. So we're talking 2,500 years before the law shows up. Now, if you look at verse number 13, it says, For until the law... Sin was in the world. There was sin. All right? But notice what it says this. It says, um, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Did you realize that uh, there were people sinning? You go to Genesis chapter number 6, before the flood, the people, their imagination are only evil continually. They have sinned against an holy God. They're, they are just, they're just vile. But they haven't broken a law. There's not a law. There's not a law for them to break. Now, do you understand in our, in our culture, we have lots of laws. In fact, we got more laws. Nobody knows how many of them we got. I did that. We got too much government. I promise you that. Way too much government. And uh, we got more laws. Nobody knows how many laws we have. But you know, when you get pulled for speeding, you say... I know everybody's probably tried it. I didn't see the sign or we want to plead ignorance. Did you know what they say? Ignorance is no defense. Because it is your job to know the law. Okay? Now, we're not talking about people who are ignorant of the law. I'm telling you, there is no law for them to break. There is none. And so, uh, so for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. When there is no law. Romans 4, 15, if you look back, it says, we're talking about uh, verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise of none effect. And so he's trying to tell you that the law can't save you. The law has never been able to, been able to do any of that. He says, verse 15, it says, for, there, for where no... For where no law is, there is no transgression. Sin is the transgression of the law. So if there's not a law, you can't transgress it. Okay? And uh, now, uh, 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. There was sin. All the way up to the law, people sinned. But the have was not imputed to them. They have not charged their account because it wasn't a law. Now, uh, notice this. Go to verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. He said, well, Jim, there wasn't no law. Well, there, there, there were a few. They didn't come out like that, but there were a few. There were a few. Uh, Adam wrote one. Then when Cain did what he did, there was a law can't murder. Uh, I think you could probably find out that there was one of, uh, of, of one man and one woman. I think you can find that with Adam and Eve. God, God didn't make Adam and Eve and Mary, Sue, and Joanne. All right? He made Adam, he made Adam and Eve. All right? And so, uh, so, uh, so the idea is this. The death reigned. The wages of sin still had to be paid. Death reigned from Adam to all the way to Moses. It rained. There are still consequences for breaking the law, whether you know the law or not. Romans 2.12 said this. We've already looked at this, but it says, But if for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law 
written in their hearts. Then it says this, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. That we've looked at that when we look at Romans chapter 12. I mean, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter number 2. But people are guilty before God because we violate the law that God had. God made us with a conscience to tell us what is right and wrong. And people violate that. And when they violate that, they're guilty. They're guilty. Now, uh, I want you to look at Romans 15. We'll put it all together. Verse 15. But not as the offense. No, no, let's go back to verse 14. It says, Nevertheless, day and death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. Now, but we have a world full of sinners, all right? But most of them didn't sin like Adam sinned. Do you know the difference between Adam's sin and their sin? Adam had a definite prohibition that God said, don't do something. The rest of them, the law of God was written in their hearts. But Adam had, Adam had the one law. God said, do not eat of that tree. Now, we can go into all kinds of reasons, and I, I, I got hung up there for several days. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the reasons why Adam could have done what he did. Uh, I think he did for several reasons. Uh, some people say he was rebellious. Some people say he wanted to have his own way. He wanted to uh, not have God rule in his life. I don't know that any of that's true. I think he sinned because of Eve. I think he chose Eve over God. All right, I do. I think he chose Eve over God. And uh, But whatever the reason is, he sinned and broke the law of God, and that's the similitude. That, that's how Adam sinned. Now, we got the entire law. We have violated the law just like Adam did. We, we knowingly do things that we know we ought not do, knowing that God has prohibited us from doing it. All right, and so, uh, and so and now, uh, go to verse number 15. And uh, for the offense of one, Adam, not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded in men. Now what's about to happen is God is fixing to show us the idea is that, 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 that it, it, it is much more. This is what we have in Adam. This is what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to show you exactly the, what the differences are. And uh, so I'm going to give you the much mores. In verse number 12, in Adam we have sin. In verse number 17, in Christ we have righteousness. So in Adam, in the first man, Adam, we have sin. The first Adam, uh, he, he brought curse to the entire human race with sin. The second Adam, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to bless the human race with righteousness. So understand, everything that, everything that Jesus does was to undo what happened in Adam. All right? It's, 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 it, it, Everything, everything about what God did in the Lord Jesus Christ is to undo the mistake that Adam did. So what we have in Adam is sin. What we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is righteousness. And then you have in Adam, we have death. Verse number 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses. In fact, death is still reigning over, over all of humanity. But death, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And so in Adam, we have death. In verse 17, in Christ, we have life. The Bible says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, I, I, think, I think we miss a lot there. The word abundantly is akin to the way where we get the word the much more. Uh, there is so much more in the Lord Jesus Christ than there ever was in Adam. And yet, too many people are satisfied and want to stay in Adam and not enjoy all the benefits of being in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Adam, we have death. The first Adam brought cemeteries and death and hell. And uh, it's the, the second Adam brought life, hope, heaven, and a resurrected body. And I sure am glad we're going to get the resurrected body. Uh, I'm glad we have that in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Adam, we look at verse number 16. Not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one that condemnation, for the free gift is of many offenses under justification. In Adam, we have condemnation. In Adam, I'm guilty and doomed and sentenced. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we have justification. Verse 18, he has justified me. It's a legal act whereby God declares me righteous. Not because of what I've done. 
I put my faith in what Jesus did, and God imputes to me the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and so, uh, I, in first Adam brings guilt. The second Adam brings imputed righteousness. Now, we've read it several times. <clears throat> but go back to verse 15, and I want you to see something. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, let's see, let's go on down to verse number 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses under justification. I go down to verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Go down to verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came. Did you know in the whole time that we've been dealing about Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ, the first man and the second man, what we have in Adam, what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the term gift or free gift is mentioned six times in about four verses. Now, I don't, God, there's no accidents with God. God's not using words just to fill up space. God, God definitely wants us to know that what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is a free gift. You can't earn it. Uh, the verses we know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, you don't earn a gift, you don't work for a gift, a gift is given and he's simply saying, I have this gift in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I, Adam, I didn't have it. When Adam, I didn't have anything but condemnation and death and, and sin. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have a free gift. And he's going to begin to show us all about this free gift. Now, um, and so in, in, in Adam, there's disobedience. If you look at verse number 19, it says, For it's by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Then it says, by the obedience of one. So you have in Adam, you have disobedience. In the Lord Jesus Christ, you have obedience. In Adam, you have his descendants who are characterized by disobedience. It's in the blood. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, his descendants, his people who are his children, they're supposed to have the quality of obedience. Y'all with me? Because it's supposed to be in the blood. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but I'll be honest with you. This idea that people get saved and then they can live like the devil, that is nowhere in this Bible. Nowhere in this Bible. This Bible teaches that if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, so much more is righteousness in you that you are compelled you to live righteously. It's part, of, it's part of the bloodline. It's part of what was infused in when God imputed you his righteousness. All right. And so, uh, I, so that's what it says. In, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are supposed to live in righteousness. Verse, number, uh, verse 21. In Adam, sin reigned. But verse 21, that is sin hath reigned unto death. Then I want you to notice in Christ, grace reigns. In the first Adam, sin dominates. In the second Adam, grace empowers. God says that he's going to finish the work he's begun in you. Grace does not encourage sin. Grace does not excuse sin. Grace does not give an alibi to sin. Grace empowers you to live holy, to live righteously. I mean, sum it up this way. The first Adam was made of the earth, was king of the old creation, was tested in a perfect garden and failed, brought sin and condemnation and brought death, made all men sinners. And we are in Adam because of a physical birth. But the second Adam, he's the Lord from heaven. 
He's the Lord of the new creation. He was tested in the wilderness and was victorious. He brought life, righteousness, and justification. His righteousness reigns. He makes believers righteous. We are in Christ through a spiritual birth. God, uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So the Old Testament begins with Adam, Genesis chapter number 5. And the very last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. Malachi 4, 6. The very last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. In Adam, we have, all we have is a curse. But the New Testament begins with Jesus in Matthew chapter number 1. And in Revelation chapter number 22, it ends with the phrase in Revelation 22, 3, no more curse. And the last word of the New Testament, the last, the last verse is, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so the New Testament begins with Jesus and ends with grace. The Old Testament begins with Adam and ends with a curse. Everything, everything that we have or everything we lost in Adam, we get back in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything Jesus does, for, I'm talking about even to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you go back to verse 13, it's a puzzle. I could tell when we was at verse number 13, people, that I, your, your, your gears were clicking. And um, for until the law, sin was in the world. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. Do you know what Jesus did? Colossians, the Bible says that Jesus nailed the entire law to his cross. Jesus fulfilled it, satisfied it, and paid it all on the cross. That's how he can justify me, declare me righteous, and then not impute my sin to me. Because where there is no law, he can't impute sin. Now you need to let that think into this a little bit. Because I promise you, that's the great, that's part of one of the greatest benefits of knowing that you're saved is that the law on my behalf has been nailed to his cross. And now he can't impute sin to me. I look at you. I see everybody got question marks all over their whole face. We'll have to come back here in chapter 5 next week. And uh, we're not going to finish. And uh, all right. And uh, as I tell you, it's a powerful truth. There's so much in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, I think part of the problem is we don't study the book. We don't read it. And the truth of the matter is, we get a lot of our doctrine from hearing what other people say about it. And we don't study this book and find out what God had, what God teaches us in this book. And I say, well, Brother Jim, yeah, we listen to you. That's true. And I tell you all the time, read this book, study this book. And uh, don't take my word for it, study this book. But it's a powerful truth when you understand that where there is no law, God will not abuse sin. That is a phenomenal truth. That that changed life if you let it. I like, my, like every truth in this book. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for truth. I thank you, Lord, that in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the damage done by Adam is taken care of, will be taken care of. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, not to, not to have our gift and not know what's in it. I pray that we'll avail ourselves of the power that we have, the grace that we have, and uh, uh, Lord, the righteousness that's in there. So many things are in this gift. I pray that we'll not just take inventory of it, we'll apply it to our lives and use it for your honor and glory. I pray that you'd help us, help our people that are sick and hurting, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, choir practice here in just a second. A little bit early. All right.